Good evening. My name is Tim Williams, one of the British Foot and Ankle Society Education Committee members, and it's my privilege to welcome you to tonight's lecture of distinction from the British Foot and Ankle Society. Tonight's talk will be on Pez Planus. For those of you joining us from new, there is a question and answer uh, icon at the bottom. Please do ask any questions that I'll put through to the speaker at the end of his talk. The attendance certificates and CPD points that now come from the Royal College of England um, will be sent out once you complete your feedback, and that will be emailed to you after the lecture has finished. For those of you looking towards the exam, you can review these lectures um, on the BOFAS website. If you go to bofas.org.uk, all the videos are saved under the educational resource section through, found through the website. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to invite tonight's speaker, Mr. Anand Pillai. Anand is a consultant in Manchester, specialising in foot and ankle, and has been a significant BOFAS contributor over the years. He has a strong provenance in education, holding honorary academic positions in Adelaide, Australia, Manchester and Malaya. As a surgeon, he's treated members of the GB Olympic squad and also uh, works with the Ultimate Fighting Championship, so not to be messed with. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Mr. Anand Pillai. Thank you, Anand. Thank you, Tim. Good evening, everybody. First of all, thank you to uh, both us and obviously to Tim for this kind of invitation to speak to you today evening on best plainness and adult acquired flat foot. And also thank you to all of you for joining me today evening. Uh, I know it's quite late and it's a work day so once again, thank you and welcome. To start with, I need to declare that I've got no financial um, conflicts of interest with regards to the contents of this presentation. And all the clinical material used in this particular presentation have been used and done so with the permission of the patients. So today's talk is on best plainness. You'll find that generally in the clinical community, people use the term pes planus, pes cavus, a normal foot, flattened arches, high arches quite loosely. And we all think that we know what it is. We know what pes planus is, we know what pes cavus is. We all feel that we have seen it and we are able to diagnose it. But are we able to quantify it? In fact, there's a way to quantify it. Stahili in 1987 actually uh, described a entity called the arch index. It essentially divides the width of the foot at the area of the middle arch by the width of the heel to calculate what's called known as the arch index. The slide is self-explanatory. It is A by B, which gives you your arch index. The normal arch in a man is around 0.7 and the woman is 0.6. It's interesting to know that the arch develops as we grew from childhood into adolescent, into adulthood, and then as we age. So both children as well as older people are generally more flat-footed than someone who is an adult male or a female. And this needs to be taken into account when you ask somebody for what you think might be a flat foot. So before you start talking about the pathology of an arch, let's talk about the stabilize the arch, what makes up the arch, what holds the arch up. So these include both static as well as dynamic stabilizers, and they include the plantar fascia, the spring ligament, about which we'll talk later, the medial teronagular joint capsule, the superficial deltoid ligament, the interosseous talocalcian ligament, the long and short plantar ligaments, and also the dynamic stabilizers, mainly the tibia superior tendon and the flexor hallucis longus tendon. So this diagram shows the relevant anatomy a bit more clearly and closely. This includes the deltoid ligament, which is highlighted here, and also the spring ligament, for those who have not come across this, is a plantar calcaneo navicular ligament, which runs from the sustentaculum of the calcaneum to the navicular. 
So there you go. That's your typical exam case. After all this talks about the FRC has thought. So there you go. That's your typical exam case. So what are we looking for here? Now, it's important to know that the causes of flat-footedness or flat feet or best planus, whichever way you want to call it, in children as well as in adults are different. There are some common causes which we would need to know about. In children, things to bear in mind, especially from an exam scenario, would be conditions like tarsal coalition and also congenital vertical talus. And the adult is mainly tibial posterior dysfunction, which probably you'll find in an exam scenario. Please note that I've not included physiological flat foot in either the pediatric population or the adult population because it's not pathological, it's a physiological condition. Right, I'll try and take you the biomechanics of what happens and how somebody develops a flat foot. So to understand this, you need to assume the foot and the ankle as a mitered hinge. Imagine the forefoot and the hind foot being attached to each other and the leg connects to the forefoot hind foot complex through the ankle joint and the talus is balanced on the junction between the midfoot and the hind foot and is supported by the tibial school seated tendon. So when the tibial school seated tendon fails, you find that the talus falls forward, causing the heel to move the other way. I.e., as the talus falls forward, the heel evolves to accommodate that and to allow that. The reason for that will become evident in a few slides time. The tail our head is generally supported by the anterior process of the calcaneum. The talus is quite intimately related to the calcaneum by the three facets. And you need to think of this as connection between uh, two screws or two cogs or two cog wheels. So as one rotates and falls forward, the other also moves accordingly. I.e., as the talus moves forward, as you can see in the picture on the right below, the calcaneum has to move out of the way and moves into eversion or valgus. The condition is more common in women, especially those over 40. It's also seen more in a uh, slightly the older age group. The female to male preponderance is three to one, and the mean age is around your late 50s. The typical patient you might find in an exam scenario or in your clinic will be a female between 45 and 65 years of age, i.e. perimenopausal or postmenopausal. A lot of them complain about postromedial ankle pain around the tibia posterior tendon. Some of them will also have pain around the anteromedial ankle where the deltoid ligament is probably being stretched by the fact that the foot is moving into valgus. A lot of them complain about sinus tarsi pain because everything on the lateral side is getting compressed. And also because arch is being stretched, they'll have plantar fascia pain. And they'll also complain about the fact that the foot has been progressively deforming or changing shape. And very rarely, they might also present with tarsal tunnel syndrome. The important thing to note here is that in your practice, you'll find patients who come to you with a flat foot with a resultant hallux valgus deformity or a hallux valgus deformity that's been worsened by the fact that the foot has actually gone into plano valgus deformity. Do not fail to look at the foot as a whole and do not stop with just looking at the forefoot in these situations. So there you are. So what are the things you would look for clinically? So, yeah, she has got a loss of medial arch, best planus. So I'm sure that even if she were to measure the arch index, I'm sure she would fall in the category of a best planus. Female patient, uh, you have to take my word for it that she's on the older side. Uh, let's put her as 55. Um, the heel is in valgus. Uh, she complains of pain along the tibial posterior tendon. And also when you ask her to go on her tiptoes or to do a single uh, stance heel raise, she's unable to do so. These are the cardinal signs of tibias posterior tendon insufficiency or adult acquired flat foot. So what causes this? It could be partly degenerative. It's believed that age has got a part to play in it. It could be related to weight and BMI, activity and physiological, and physiological flat foot predisposes people to develop adult acquired flat foot at later in life. It could be related to previous trauma, but whatever the actual inciting cause, what happens is that once the process starts, the pathophysiology snowballs and you get multiple points of failure of the foot leading to a completely flattened foot. So 
It's interesting to know that the deeper exposure tendon has got an area of hypervascularity between the medial malleolus and its insertion into the navicular. There's a relative area of ischemia where the tendon becomes dysfunctional and causes problems by failing. The way the tibia posterior tendon is designed and functions because of its excursion, a small increase in length of failure can, loss, can result in loss in function. So you get a flat foot and subsequent heel valgus. And as that starts happening, your Achilles, which is a lot more stronger and generally normal in these patients, becomes a heel everter. And subsequently in the longer term, the Achilles gets contracted and becomes a contributor to the deformity. So there you are. As I, as I mentioned before, there's a snowballing pathophysiology, synovitis, tendinosis, lengthening of the tendon, unlocking of the two parts joints, spring ligament degeneration of failure, heel valgus, subsequent rupture of the tendon and the spring ligament, the tail navicular joint uncovers, and the four foot abducts. So when you see these patients, it's important to know, you need to ask them, what is the main complaint? What have they come to see you about? Is the foot deformed? Is the foot deformity correctable? Are you able to passively correct it? Is there a fixed component to the hind foot or the full foot malalignment or deformity? Is the Achilles tendon tight? Are there any other associated problems? Is there a hallux valgus? Is there a secondary arthritis? Is there a tarsal tunnel syndrome? These are all pertinent points that you have to examine and have to think about when you examine these patients, especially in the exam scenario. And also, are there any apparent causes? Is the patient rheumatoid? Is there an inflammatory arthropathy or gout per se? It's important to inquire about inflammatory uh, joint disease, any previous trauma, was there any flat footedness as a child? Is there a history of orthotic use? And for all patients, you should also ask history of diabetes, neurological conditions, circulatory problems, and also family history, because it'll have a bearing on the treatment you might be offering them. So in examination, to repeat once more, you have the valgus heel, you have the loss of medial arch, you have the pain along the tibia posterior tendon, and you've got two minute toes sign because of the way the foot has collapsed and the forefoot is now abducted and pronated. You find that you see two minute toes and you see from the back. So both sides are here are pathological. So you can see that you see two minute toes. And the patient generally would not be able to do a single stand stories. Also, when you look from the side, you will find that the navicular tuberosity sags and it's more closer to the ground, and you will not be able to insinuate your finger into the arch uh, or underneath the foot. And patients also complain of pain and discomfort along the tibia posterior tendon. You may be able to palpate some thickening, some synovitis, and even else some tenderness along the, along the tibial tendon and also along the deltoid ligament on occasions. Special tests to look in these circumstances include uh, the isolated testing for the tibia posterior tendon. You hold the foot inverted and plantar flexed and ask the patient to hold the foot in, i.e. you put the tip post into contraction all the while feeling for the tendon and see as to whether or not it's functioning and compare the power with the opposite side. You need to elevate the, eliminate the tibia anterior because it also is a inverter. So that's why you plant the flex the foot. Always watch for the EHL because patients can sometimes try and recruit the EHL to allow you to have that inversion movement or inversion power. The similar skill test for a gastrocnemius tightness, we all know how to do that. Essentially look for dorsiflexion of the ankle with the knee extended and the knee flexed. And lastly, the plantar fascia jack test to ensure that when you dorsiflex the foot, the arch reforms, suggesting that it's a flexible uh, deformity. You can see here how this particular individual was able to go on stiff toes on when he was standing on both feet. But the moment he was asked to go on his uh, pathological left side, he found it unable to go on tiptoes, i.e. I'm just trying to drive the point that despite the fact that they have pathology, some individuals will be able to do a double stand stories, but when you ask them to do a single stand stories, they'll be unable to do so. And also, if they are able to come off the ground, the heel will not invert into normal varus, which is what you should find. It generally never crosses the midline. And also, it is a good practice if you think there's a pathology and patients are able to do it, to ask them to do it repeatedly to see as to whether or not the TBR school see the tendon fatigues more quicker. 
Right, x-rays, there are some classical features in x-rays that you should be looking for. One is the calcaneal pitch, as the foot flattens, the pitch decreases. Mary's line, that's the uh, um, relationship between the uh, talus and the first metatarsal. Normally, it's a straight line. You can see here that as the foot flattens, that relationship is flattened and the line uh, actually cracks or breaks. And lastly, there are a couple of angles which are quite useful from a correction point of view. The relationship between the talus and the first metatarsal, which normally should be in line, and also the coverage of the teonavicular joint in percentage terms, as we can see in the third picture or the third x-ray in the middle of your slide. And if for epidemiological purposes or for research purposes, Kite's angle, that's a talocalcane angle, it's a good measure, especially see as to what your pre-op and post-operative deformities were. I would not expect you to mention that or measure that in an exam scenario, but it's important that you're aware of it. MRI scans are quite useful. They will let you know as to whether or not the tendon is involved, whether it's in a tendinopathy, and also it'll let you know as to whether there's any fluid on the tendon. But MR scans are not pathognomonic. Sometimes when you have a burned out typos tendinopathy where you got the typos not functioning, a deformity present, uh, the MRI scans may come back as being relatively normal. The classification of typos tendinopathy and the typos dysfunction is by Johnson & Storm. It is a good classification. It's a prognostic classification, and also it helps you in the decision-making regarding what treatment you're gonna offer. So it goes from stage one to stage three, that is the original classification, and stage four was added by Myerson. So let's look at them. Now, stage one is tendinopathy. The tendon length is normal, and there's no deformity. In stage two, there's lengthening. There's a deformity, but it's flexible. In stage three, the deformity now becomes fixed. And in stage four, the deformity progresses and causes tilting of the, tilting of the talus with an ankle mortis, and i.e. the deformity goes from the plane of valgus into the ankle. So looking at the Johnson Storm classification, it's also important to know as to what happens to individual structures as the classification goes from one to three and obviously four. So you can see that in stage one, the tendon is generally degenerate. The hind foot is mobile. There's no deformity. There is pain generally on the tendon itself. They are able to do a single stance heel raise, but they struggle to do that. And you might not find the classical two minute toe sign. By stage two, there's obvious elongation. There's a hind foot valgus deformity. It is correctable though. And you'll find that there's marked weakness of the tip post and inability to go on your uh, tiptoes. And by stage three, there's a deformity, sometimes a rupture or significant elongation of the tendon, and the deformity is not correctable in this situation. Treatment should start off by non-operative measures. In the acute scenario, sometimes rest, even casting for a few weeks, along with injections. I'm not talking about steroids, but other modern injection techniques such as platelet-rich plasma, et cetera, seem to have a role. Physiotherapy after the acute phase to strengthen the mus muscles around the foot to try and hold it together, especially the intrinsics and the achilles to try and stretch it out, obviously has got role to play. And orthotics can be helpful because orthotics can provide significant correction of the hind foot and can help in improving mobility and function. But please be aware that in most severe cases, the orthotic may be more accommodative than corrective. The problem is that younger and more active patients struggle to tolerate the orthotic in the longer term. And orthotics generally are not curative, but they merely address the symptoms and attempt to control progression. But they do have a role. It's important that when you are trying to manage this problem, you do start off with a non-operative measure initially. Now, we are surgeons, we like operative treatment. So most of this talk is about the operative management of uh, typos dysfunction. Now, it's quite important to know that the Johnson Storm classification is very useful in deciding as to what sort of treatment may be useful at each stage. So this is uh, a simple algorithm. In stage one, um, the tendon is inflamed. There is medial pain, no deformity. They do well with a simple tendon debridement. Occasionally, you can combine that with tendon transfer if you think the tendon is quite weak. In stage two, this is generally where the more common surgeries come into, um, in, into their room. These include medial calcaneal osteotomies, 
tier recession and FDL transfer and the spring ligament repair with or without a tenavicular fusion if necessary. As the deformity becomes more fixed, that is stage three and stage four, you are now looking at situations where you probably have to perform a fusion. Are you not able to correct the deformity without doing a fusion? In stage three, it's a foot fusion, it's a triple fusion. And in stage four, the fusion needs to extend into the ankle so it becomes pantera. We have been through that already. Right, so this is a stage one uh, condition where there was a no deformity. There was localized discomfort and pain and tendinopathy. You can see how the tendon looks degenerate once it's been debrided. And all that was done here was that the tendon was debrided, cleaned off, the synovitis was excised, and the patient did quite well. So stage two, we already talked about that it's a flexible deformity. And that's where the mainstay of treatments from a surgical point of view come into foot. These include the medial calcaneal osteotomy, tear recession, tendon transfers, and spread ligament repair. So let's look at them one by one now. So why an FDL transfer? The reason that you do an FDL transfer is that you can see here from an anatomical point of view, uh, number one uh, in the slide is your tibia scrosia tendon. And number two is your flexor digitorum longus. So it's adjacent. It's easy to use, it's nearby, it's easily accessible. It's a tendon that can be uh, sacrificed with very little comorbidity. It is a tendon that is in phase with the uh, tibia scrosia tendon, but it has not only about 30% of innate power when you're transferring it. You can see here uh, the, the procedure of a tendon transfer. The side of the top left shows the damaged tibia scrosia tendon, which is thickened. And, uh, the, and the, on the right shows the flexor digital and longus tendon uh, being harvested and isolated. And you can see how I've traced that tendon down all the way down to the master knot of Henry, i.e. the crossover between the F flexor digital and longus and the flexor halysis longus. So there is a connection between the FDL and FHL in the middle of the foot. So if you were to harvest the FDL proximal to the master knot of Henry, then the FHL will drive the distal FDL with very little morbidity. And you can see how the tendon has been harvested and prepared for transfer. So these are a couple of cadaveric slides which shows you exactly what I mean. The start on the top shows you the crossover between the flexor digitorum longus and the flexor halysis longus. And also how there's a crossing over between the tendons. So, and, and there are connections between the two tendons at this point. So if you harvest the flexor digitorum proximal to the master knot, then the distal aspect of the FDL works through the FHL motor. So once the tendon is harvested, the way the tendon transfer is done is by passing the tendon from a plantar to dorsal uh, direction through the navicular, through a drill hole and suturing it to, to itself or by using an interference group. And you can see on the top left slide, uh, sorry, on the top left picture, uh, the, the blue area, which I marked PT, is the attachment of the original tibialis posterior tendon. The tendon itself should be tensioned and sutured back in plantar flexion and diversion and maximal correction because it always stretches out uh, in due course. You can see here how I passed the tendon through, pulled it through and tensioned it, and now I'm holding it down with the interference screw into the navicular. Right, so I think no talk about tibia sposia tendinopathy would be uh, appropriate or complete without talking about the spring ligament. The spring ligament is something that we are being more and more aware of now. It connects the anterior sustentacle to the plantar navicular. It supports the head of the talus, i.e. it forms the articular surface for the head of the talus. And there's a term quite used in some circles called astabulum pedis. It's an anatomical term, i.e. the head of the talus rests on the spring ligament. So as the spring ligament ruptures or becomes attenuated, that's what allows the talus to fall forwards which we talked about earlier on, allowing the calcaneum to evert and go into valcus. Um, apparently there are three distinct bands to the spring ligament, but these are seen only on MRI. When you actually inspect it clinically or surgically, you are not able to uh, isolate the three bands. These include the supramedial, the medial plantar, and the infraplantar bundles. And the picture on the right tells you as to which part is which. The two ways to tackle the spring ligament, you can see here, uh, in the patient that we, I showed you earlier on, 
the uh, McDonald's is pointing towards a spring ligament. Uh, I'm normally, if I'm repairing the spring ligament, would take a V-shaped wedge out of the spring ligament and refit by putting multiple stitches across it and try to double breast it like a hernia repair, bring it together and shortening it to give some uh, tension to it and to repair it. And you can see where the drill hole for the tendon transfers are made in the navicular. An alternative would be to use a synthetic material. Here it's internal brace. It's the same uh, type of brace you might use for a, a Boston repair um, using um, a, a synthetic graft. And here you would actually put one push lock uh, into the uh, sustentaculum talus. And then the two loops are brought through the tunnel of the navicular along with the tendon transfer and tension providing uh, a support, not just a spring ligament, but also to tendon transfer. There are studies which have shown not long-term, short-term studies that a, a synthetic graft does better, at least in the short to medium term, functionally compared to a simple spring ligament repair. So let's talk about calcium loss osteotomy. Why do a calcium loss osteotomy? Now, obviously, yes, you're doing a calcium loss osteotomy to medialize the heel because you got a high foot valgus. So you are medializing the heel by doing a calcium loss osteotomy and moving it more medially. But the reason you're doing it is to try and decrease the load of the teronavicular joint. Biomechanically, as I've shown in the uh, diagram, which is got a blue background at the bottom of your slide, by moving the calcaneum medially, you are actually increasing the Achilles tendon supination movement arm, i.e. the Achilles becomes uh, less of a, um, a deformer and more of a corrector for somebody with hallux, uh, sorry, some, for somebody with press planus deformity, that makes sense. And also by moving it more medially, you're changing the subtalar axis, thereby decreasing the load on the teronavicular joint, i.e. hopefully allowing your tendon transfer uh, to act, not to be strained as much as otherwise it would have been. Remember that the flexor digitorum longus, when it is immediately transferred, has only about 30% of the power of your original tibialis posterior tendon. It's almost like replacing a truck tire with a bicycle tire. It does hypertrophy, it does take load later on, but not initially. So it, the osteotomy can be done either open, it can be done MIS, it does not matter how you do it. The principle is to medialize the calcaneum and it's important that you medialize it sufficiently. Uh, it's my feeling that you should, you should medialize at least by about 10 millimeters to actually get a good correction. I prefer to use a plate partly because I know exactly how much I'm transferring or, or moving. And also it helps me to control that movement as I'm actually tightening the plate down. And you can see on the APB of the ankle and the heel, how much correction has been achieved or how much displacement has been achieved in this particular case. Does it do well? There are lots of studies uh, which have shown that uh, the, the workhorse of the post reconstruction, which includes middle calcium loss osteotomy and FDL transfer has got 90 to 95% good outcomes in the longer term. So adjunct procedures, as I said, include, the first one would be, we need to talk about, would be a gastroprocession. In these individuals, the Achilles tendon becomes a deformer by the fact that the calcaneum has gone to the valgus, and over a period of time, it becomes tight. So a lot of these patients generally need to have, depending upon your um, cybersecure test, need to have a gastroprocession. The level of the gastroprocession can vary depending upon your preference, I do something between a strayer and a malpias. That's how I was trained. That's what I do still. And it has got good results in my hands. And uh, this is how I do it. So normally I would mark out the Craig's fat pad, which is the calcaneal fat pad. You can see in the dotted triangle. Then you can see how the muscle belly of the uh, gastrocnemius uh, has been marked out. Um, somewhere around the midpoint, I make a small incision to get down to the musculotendinous junction or just beyond the musculotendinous junction of the uh, gastrocnemius muscle. It's quite important here that depending upon the level of your incision, you are very aware of the sural nerve. It's quite useful to also to know that the sural nerve has got a vein that runs with it. If you do know where the vein is, you know where the nerve is. I normally try and visualize the nerve every single time 
because a pseudoneuroma at this site is very painful and the patient will not be happy despite how good a correction you get. You can see here a small incision. You can see the epineurals being exposed and you can see how it's cut. You can do a, a chevron incision. Um, you can do a straight cut, whatever your preference is. And then you dorsiflex the ankle, allowing the Achilles to stretch out. And you can see how I pointed out there, you can see the serial nerve and the vein sitting just exactly on where you'd normally made your cut if you had not been careful. But the problem with stage two typos dysfunction is that it's a very, very group. And when you actually look at the original classification by Johnson's term, they do not look at the relationship between the hind foot and the forefoot. There are situations where the hind foot is flexible, but the forefoot is not, or the hind foot is completely correctable, but the forefoot may be incompletely correctable, i.e. there could be discrepancy between the hind foot and the forefoot. So the stage two Johnson and Storm has been subclassified, and it's quite important that from a clinical point of view and from treatment point of view that you're aware of this. So stage 2A means that it's passively correctable hind foot and the forefoot is correctable. Uh, sorry, the forefoot is passively correctable and the hind foot varus is correctable within less than 15 degrees. Stage B uh, or 2B is it's a passively correctable forefoot and the varus is greater than 15 degrees, i.e. the forefoot corrects beautifully, but the, um, I do apologize, here, uh, stage 2A means that the hind foot is fully correctable, but the forefoot radius is still 15 degrees or less than 15 degrees. Stage 2B is the hind foot is fully correctable, but there's still some persistent forefoot radius. And stage 2C is the hind foot is fully correctable, but the forefoot is not, i.e. there's a dissociation between the two. So repeat again, the hind foot is always correctable. If the forefoot is incompletely corrected, then that's where 2B and 2C comes into play. So this is where you might require to have some added procedures to your medial displacement calculation loss geotomy and your tendon transfer and your tear recession. These include additional procedures such as a cotton osteotomy, sinus arsa implants, and lateral column lengthening. I'm just going to briefly go through some of these procedures um, in brief. The first one is the arthrosis or the sinus arsa implant. It's been around for a long time. It's very popular in Europe. It's very popular in the US. Essentially, it's a plug that goes in the sinusarsi and does not allow the talus to drop down. Essentially, it supports the talar neck and it stops, literally stops the lateral talar process. There's a lot of evidence that it works quite well in children and especially in adults and best players. So there is a biomechanical classification that are different types of implants, but the most commonly used implants in uh, adult practice, definitely in the UK, and at least in my practice, are these self-locking implants which look like little screws. They're not screwed in, they are literally jammed in and they stay in place and the grooves essentially are helpful to ensure that it doesn't spit out. You can see here, there's a sinus tarsi incision being made. The sinus tarsi is clear and the implant is inserted into the sinus tarsi. And that's how it looks once it's fully inserted. Please be aware that the sinus tarsi implant should not be used in isolation. It is not a very forgiving implant. It can sometimes cause sinus tarsi pain the longer term. Some of them pop out and dislodge, they need removal. But generally, even after they're removed, the correction, as long as you, as long as they're able to maintain the correction and the implant in place up to about six months or so, it is maintained. A cotton osteotomy is when you do a plantar flexion osteotomy of the middle cuneiform to correct uh, the forefoot. And lastly, is the lateral column lengthening. If you still, still have significant hind foot, or I'm sorry, if you still have significant forefoot abduction, there are a couple of ways to do this. Essentially, it's an incision or an osteotomy made between the, um, uh, just, just be either between the anterior and middle face of the calcaneum or uh, between the middle and posterior face of the calcaneum and it's lengthened through that. Another way of doing that, obviously, would be to do a distraction fusion of the calcaneum cuboid joint, which does have its own problems of pain and stiffness in the longer term. It's a very powerful tool and generally it will serve for individuals where you have corrected the hind foot, but you're still struggling to correct the forefoot and it's a fixed deformity, or you're not able to do that by using soft tissue procedures. That's an example of how a lateral, lateral column lengthening corrects your telonavicular joint.
Um, well, if you are um, in, if you want to be really adventurous, there's a new technique that's been described. It's called a zebo osteotomy. It's actually a scarf osteotomy with a calcaneal. I must admit that I've got very limited experience with this, but then it can correct your hindroid valgus as well as do your lengthening at the same time. So you can do a, an all-in-one osteotomy. I think possibly that might be the future. So lastly, we come to uh, the more severe forms of deformity. Uh, that's a stage three and stage four, which are more fixed. So you are looking at fusion procedures here. So obviously you try non-operative measures if you can, but otherwise a la carte or in combination, you're looking at either triple fusions or pantella fusions. An example here would be a triple fusion for a stage three deformity. And you can see how the correction has come quite nicely. Another example again, a, a triple arthrodesis with good correction. And lastly, in stage four, you would do a pantella fusion, i.e. you would extend your fusion onto the ankle joint also. Uh, there are opportunities if uh, one is keen to think of trying to preserve the ankle by doing a triple arthrodesis, trying to reconstruct the deltoid if you can, and then trying to keep the ankle moving either if it's not arthritic to keep the ankle or the arthritic to try an ankle replacement. But the results of these, at least in my hands, are quite poor because deltoid reconstruction is uh, still a, a difficult procedure with very variable results. To summarize, what would I do? Um, if there's no deformity and just a neuropathy, I would do a cyanobectomy. Um, if there's multimodal deformity, my workhorse would be a middle calculus osteotomy and the FDL transfer. Once I've done my, my middle calculus osteotomy and FDL transfer, if there's still some flexible forefoot of no, of deformity, I would combine that with a sinusarsa implant or arth arthrosis. Uh, for rigid deformities, you would have to do a triple fusion. But for severe deformities, which are flexible, uh, you need to think in terms as to whether or not once you're done your MCO and your FDL transfer, whether a lateral corner lengthening is needed. All these may or may not require a gastroc resection. Once you're done all this, you look at the forefoot and if there's still residual forefoot varus or medial column instability, you need to think in terms of doing a cotton osteotomy or a plantar flexion osteotomy of the first ray, or you have to do a lapidistic to correct it and where there are circumstances where the, where the instability is more anterior or more distal, you might need to do a navicular uniform fusion. I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Anand, thank you very much indeed. Um, that was a great run, th run through of a very, very comprehensive review of what we do with Flatfoot. And it, it's, it's raised a number of questions. It's um, basically, it's overall, the well, best way to take it, I think, is to work through the different areas and, and different um, stages as you summarized wonderfully. Um, in stage one, is there any place for cortisone injections, in your opinion? Um, the answer is no, because um, by and large, the majority of patients, it's a, it's a tendinopathy, it's a, it's a degenerative condition. Very rarely, or the very early stages of the disease, you might have an element of tendinitis or peritendinitis, or it could be a purely inflammatory pathology. But I think it's almost impossible to pick this up clinically. But if someone were to have an MRI at the very earliest onset of symptoms, which showed purely peritendinitis and a normal tendon, and if you have a very uh, good sonologist who's able to infiltrate just the sheath and avoid the tendon or not, and not damage the tendon, then the answer is yes. Do you tend to immobilize them afterwards? Um, I do. I think, um, I think, I think it's not a question of immobilizing, but I think if you are planning to inject around tendons or in the vicinity of tendons, I think it's import, important to tell patients that they possibly need to rest and not yeah. overexert themselves at least for a few weeks because otherwise you're just setting yourself for a rupture <laughs> in a worst scenario. And there's a question here come through. Um, when you're looking at the stage two and assessing it, do you think there's any role for MRI in stage two assessment? 
I think there's a role for MRI because um, again, it depends upon the the, uh, the stage of the disease and, and and the snapshot or the time frame in which you actually send the patient for the MRI scan. So you will on occasions find evidence of uh, tendon degeneration, tendon thickening. You might also find discrete tears in the tendon. You also will find fluid around the tendon sheet. But also, as I mentioned in my talk, in some situations where you are seeing patients quite late, the MRI may be completely normal. Mm -hmm. But the patients have got a deformity and a dysfunctional tendon. Do you sometimes see subtibular impingement as well? You do. I think in very severe deformities, I think patients normally complain of pain sometimes on the outer aspect of the ankle. And that is either because of the other calcaneal fibular impingement or soft tissue impingement from the peroneum. And when you're doing your stage two reconstruction, yeah. um, using the medial side, I'll, I'll read into here, um, do you always cut out tip post or do you ever leave it behind? Um, I always cut out the tip post because uh, there are two reasons. Number one, I think it's dysfunctional. Um, it is uh, occupying space where I need to put my tendon transfer into. It gets in the line of my tendon transfer and I feel it's the pain driver. The pain is coming from the dysfunctional tendon. So if mm -hmm. you leave the dysfunctional tendon there, uh, you, might, you might in the longer term or after, after rehab, you might, you might get movement back, but you might, have, you might continue to have pain. And in a situation of stage two uh, tip post, but in a lady with a high BMI, very overweight, would you go straight to double or triple fusion in that situation or attempt reconstruction? Um, I think it's something that you need to discuss with the patient. And I must admit that there have been situations where I have just gone in for a tail and avicular joint fusion rather than trying to do a soft tissue procedure. Because when you know the patient physiology and when you know that the soft tissue quality may be quite poor, and this may be also a situation when you have patients who got inflammatory, inflammatory arthropathies. I think in, the, in those circumstances of doing a tendon transfer, I think uh, the results are not as good. I would probably consider some form of limited fusion. I don't think it would be a triple. I think you can very well do a calcaneal osteotomy and a teonatical joint fusion. And having, just going back to your sinus tarsite implants, uh, um, a gentleman called Dr. Gonzai is asking, do you ever use these alone? Um, and do you always take them out electively? Um, I never do them alone. But having said that, that would be a lie. Mm -hmm. I think uh, there, have been, there has been situations where uh, patients are not suitable for any significant surgery because of either their skin condition or poor vascularity or the general comorbidities or the lifespan is rather poor and they're struggling to walk, then there is a role for it to be considered in isolation. But in your general practice, I think on its own, I don't think it has got a role. It needs to be combined with other procedures. I don't take them out. Uh, I don't take them out unless they have a problem. And with that combination of surgeries you talked about, do you tend to use an a la carte approach or do you tend to use the calcaneal osteotomy, the FDL transfer, spring ligament reconstruction, every time? Um, I, I would probably start off with doing a tear recession first, because the concern here is that if somebody has got a very tight Achilles tendon, there are two reasons here. Number one is that once you do a calcaneal loss job, you'll find that your calcaneum writes up. And it's very difficult using your small incision to bring your calcaneum down. So if you think you need a tear recession, you probably should be doing it first, number one. Secondly, once you're on your tendon transfer to come back to do a tear recession will be quite difficult because you probably do a fairly robust dorsiflexion movement. So I think it's a tear recession first, followed by the calcane loss chiotomy, then moving on to the FDL transfer. And then if needed, depending upon the tail and joint coverage, will be a sinus tarsi implant if necessary. Or if it's very severe, it looks like the significant forefoot abduction, despite the hind foot being in neutral, mm -hmm. then I would think in terms of whether I need to do a lateral column lengthening. Okay. Well, uh, well, let's move on to stage three briefly now. Um, do you avoid fusing the calcaneal cuboid joint when it comes to operating on rigid deformity? Um, it depends. I think uh, on occasions where you are able to achieve complete correction without doing a calcaneal cuboid joint fusion, you can leave it out. And I would say that that would be more often uh, the case than not. 
but there are situations where you will have to take the calcaneal cuboid joint down to actually get the correction you need. And you generally find that the subtalar and the tail joints are more affected and the calcaneal cuboid joint is relatively spared in a number of these individuals. Um, another question here, do you see, if you see a coalition in an adult with flat foot, do you always fuse? It depends upon the percentage of your coalition and also your type of coalition. If it's a small fibrous coalition and the rest of the articular surface looks intact and normal, you could take it down. But if it's a large bony coalition, then I think you are probably headed towards a fusion. Brilliant.